introduce Felicity Carter. I, like a few other people who are chatting before we started, have had the privilege of working with Felicity both at Leiningers and now. Uh, Felicity is the executive editor of a new wine online discovery platform called Pix, which is launched in very quiet beta. Um, and there's a really rich and wonderful magazine that's part of the the, the platform. And, and Felicity is the mastermind of the of the magazine, working with um, under content uh, uh, chief content officer Erica Ducey, whom some of you may also be familiar with. Um, Felicity is originally from Australia, but for many years worked for Miningers. Um, and uh, really, you know, Meininger Verlag is Europe's biggest um, wine and spirits publisher. I'm sure we're all familiar with it. Uh, Meininger's Wine Business International, a very important uh, English language publication for that uh, has correspondence from 30 countries and subscribers in 38. Uh, so it's a very wide penetration. Uh, before moving to Europe, Felicity um, wrote for the Sydney Morning Herald and the Age newspapers in Australia, and she was also a correspondent for the Guardian USA. Um, she is an international judge and a really engaging speaker, and I'm really excited to hear what she has to say about clean wine, so-called. Thank you, and over to you, Felicity. All right, here I go, making another attempt to share my screen. Bear with me. Okay, that's not the bit you're supposed to see. Right. Okay, so this is called Clean Wine and Unhealthy Claims. So um, as many of you may know, clean wine is very much an American phenomenon, but uh, that sort of sprang into public consciousness last year. But the reason that I think it's really important to talk about is although the, this particular type of wine is an American phenomenon, it's the manifestation of some very, very unhealthy trends that have been bubbling away in wine for the last four or five years. I've been writing about wine in one way or another for 20 years. I've, I've done everything. I started as a copywriter working for a direct wine marketing company. I've written for newspapers. Um, I've written about the business of wine. And in all of that time, I haven't seen anything as potentially damaging and dangerous to the wine industry as this. So why does it bother me so much and where does it come from? So many of you probably know this, that Cameron Diaz, the, uh, the, the ex-actress and a friend called Catherine Power, who actually comes out of the beauty industry, decided to launch this wine last year called Aveline, which they, um, they said was, well, have a look at the publicity. Um, they said it was, you know, it's a clean wine, it's got no additives in it, it's organic, it's, it's better for you, um, it's vegan, and, and the big promise that they make is this promise of no unnecessary additives. So it's, it, was, it turned out that this turned a spotlight on this whole new category that people didn't know about, this clean wine category. It turned out that there were a whole lot of small companies that were beginning to, to brand themselves as clean wine companies, particularly this one, the Good Clean Wine Company, started by two young women who actually wanted wine for their beauty spa. And so um, they also came out of the, the beauty background. And this is really important, which I'll get to in a second. So what, what is this trend and what is it, what's been driving it? Well, there's a, there's a few things. So it's the sort of culmination of a whole lot of things coming together. One is the concern for the environment, including vegan and vegetarian diets. And I think we could all be on board with that. It comes out of the, the desire to see wines that are made much more sustainably. Um, it also comes out of something called the keto wine trend, uh, keto diet, which I'll get into at the, at, in a minute. Clean beauty plays a very big role in this, and again, I'll explain this in a second, and also wellness generally. The other thing, of course, is natural wines and some of the noise that natural winemakers have been making, particularly around the idea that natural wines are healthier, not just in terms of the way that they're the viticulture is done, but they're literally healthier for you to drink. The natural, a number of natural wine people have been saying for a while that um, it's, it's wine without hangovers. Yep. And, and if you can see, you know, if you can see this story, which turned up in the New York Times in 2019, she actually says, you know, I, I, I did a, a, a cleansing diet. This is very much the language of wellness. And I, I got rid of all of these toxins from my diet and then when I started to put it back in I, I got rid of toxic wine as well I, I didn't have an aggressive hangover anymore there's very much this idea of wine is now edging into being a wellness product 
This comes from the website Goop, and it says literally natural wines will give you less hangover. And she says in it, natural wines don't just deliver less of a hangover, but that most readily available wines, even the really expensive ones, are often full of pesticides, fungicides, and fertilizer. Alcohol doesn't in fact kill everything. It's a bummer to think that while making a conscious effort to buy all organic meats and vegetables, we've likely been drinking harmful toxins for years. So this is positioning conventional wine. That's pretty much all wine that's not natural wine as being full of chemicals and toxins and pesticides. Um, and that, that they're distinguishing between there are good, clean and healthy wines. And then there are these other sort of noxious things which will hurt you if you drink them. And when it comes to these claims, wine companies are increasingly actually willing to come out and say, if you drink our wines, you'll get less of a hangover than if you drink those nasty conventional wines. So um, big business has taken note of this. There's a company called Wink, which is a data-driven company. They, they basically buy lots of bulk wine and they rebrand it in all different ways and they sell it online. Um, I think they, they intended to take their company public last year. Um, I think there were some, some problems around it. But by the end of 2019, they had $38 million in revenue. This is really big business. And one of the wines that they put out last year was this The Wonderful Wine Company, which is, is using sort of hippie imagery. It's, it's tapping a little bit into biodynamic imagery, even though it's not biodynamic. These are bulk anonymous wines from the south of France, um, but they're being, they're being sold as somehow more spiritual and more you know, they're just better for you in all sorts of ways. So when I spoke to Brian Smith, who was the co-founder of Wink, he said, this is wellness without deprivation. It's, it's having your cake and eating it too. And he said that this is a trend that was coming out of Los Angeles. Meditation, wellness, self-improvement, people trying to find balance in their life, and they're trying to do it through the products that they buy. Um, so it's very much a it's very much a capitalist trend. So here are some of the, the wines that have sprung up um, in the US. There's this Life Fine Mind and Body, which is by Chinchero, which is a really big wine company. Um, it's a, they call it premium low calorie alcohol wine. It's actually um, uh, spinning cone technology to remove the alcohol. Um, the Fit Fine Cabernet Sauvignon it's stocked in Whole Foods. It's been enormously successful. And the guy who does this is really interesting. He's been interviewed by, by mining. It's not by me, but by a colleague. And, and he's actually very serious about this. He's, he's done research on what are the things that will make you um, feel a bit lousy if you, you drink one of which is something called biogenic amines which I'll come back to and that can be produced through malolactic fermentation so th this wine none of it there's no oak in any of it and this is sold as a big um a big benefit that these wines won't don't have any nasty thing in in them that you can you can drink them and they're, they're actually healthy for you um, he's managed to actually build a really big community around this. This is people who are into, as you can see, diet, exercise, they care a lot about what they eat and they drink, and they're particularly involved in the keto diet, which I'll get to in a second. So Dry Farm Wines is another one that um, made a big, is making a big splash inside the United States. Now, Dry Farm Wines doesn't call itself a clean wine company, and the founder, Todd White, is totally against it. He sees um, clean wine as being a marketing gimmick, whereas he is the authentic professional selling authentic wines. Dry Farm Wines is really interesting. He only sells um, natural wines. He sells them from um, real producers, their, their, their names that you would recognise. He chooses wines that are um, no irrigation. They're all under 12.5%. So the wines themselves are fine. And, and I, I, in some ways, he's a really good guy because he pays people really well and he pays them on time, which I'm all for in the wine industry. <laughs> There's not enough of that. But if you look at his advertising, he adver when you go onto his website, he doesn't talk about the farmers, the land, or whatever. He's got all of these performance leaders. They're people who are into different diets and, and um, biohacking, which is biohacking is wellness by another name. It's what it's called when men are involved rather than wellness is for women and therefore it's suspect biohacking is, is equally bullshit, but because it's men, it doesn't, it doesn't attract the same sort of opprobrium as wellness does. But again, he, he sells his wines as natural, additive free, they're lab tested for purity, they're sugar free. And this word purity keeps coming up all the time. So that th this isn't just wine for pleasure any longer. This is wines that are a moral decision. They're better for your soul. They're more purified. They're more sinless. They're sort of, it, it's, like, it's like participating in the immaculate conception if you drink these wines. 
right, let's talk about the keto diet. The keto diet is the key to a lot of this. It's actually a really dangerous diet that was popularized in the 1970s. And the idea is it removes any um, carbohydrates or sugars. When it first came out, it fell out of popular um, culture because of the number of people who actually died from doing it. They had vitamin deficiencies. Oprah got into it again in the late 1980s when she dropped a lot of weight um, and then nobody really used it except for biohackers. But um, this report from science came out in 2013 that said if you drop sugar from your diet, it can be an anti-aging, uh, have anti-aging properties because sugar is an inflammatory which will make you age. And then Tim Ferriss, who wrote the four hour work week, and he's a biohacker as well, introduced it and it became, it's gone off in a big way. It still remains a dangerous diet. It's not good for you to eat like this. Um, but now it's a, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and the key to it is getting rid of sugar, which of course wine has in it. So dry farm wines make selling sh uh, sugarless wines their, their key selling point. And they do a lot of this advertising on social media where they'll show you glasses that are full of um, sugar cubes. As we know, of course, you can't actually add sugar to wine. Um, but this they're popularizing this idea that, that, that wine is just packed with sugar. Um, and he, he actually says that when he does speeches, I, I listened to a speech that he made in 2019. And he... Um, uh, he was talking to a, a group, I don't know who he was talking to, but, but he's full of conspiracy theories. He actually said to this group, there is a deep, dark collusion between the wine industry and politicians, and the wine industry has spent tens of millions of dollars to keep you uninformed. And in that speech, he told his audience that the wine trade has spent millions of dollars to keep ingredients off the label, that um, the reason that alcohol has gone up is, is nothing to do with climate change or anything like that. It's because the wine industry is doing what big tobacco is doing. It's adding more alcohol to wine to get people more addicted so that they can get more customers um, and so on so this is this is really this you know this is really dangerous I've interviewed him and he's very um, he's very evangelical and he believes the stuff that he says he believes that wine is full of GMOs he believes that they add lots of sugar and that he's kind of an honest broker in the world of wine his um, his social media spend is quite high if you go on to things like Facebook and you put wine in chances are if you're in the US dry farm wines add with the glasses full of sugar is going to is going to pop up he also went from 50 members in 2015 to more than 100,000 today so this is this is quite big business this clean beauty trend is another thing that that is really important so clean beauty really started about a decade ago and it started from a misunderstanding about ingredients in cosmetics there's an ingredient called parabens which is a an anti-mold or an antifungal so it's really important when you make cosmetics that they don't um they basically don't rot in the jar um and so one of the things that was used was parabens and there was a a study done of breast cancer where somebody got a slide with um, a, a tumour on it and what they found was the tumour was full of parabens and this was published and this this kicked off this um, this what's the word um, almost witch hunting about parabens so everybody immediately pulled parabens out of their products it turned out when they went back to the laboratory that actually there were no parabens in the breast tissue it hadn't contributed to breast cancer is that all of the slides in this laboratory had been cleaned um, with material that had parabens in it but even even um, once that was reported it didn't change the fact that the the whole beauty industry began to look at what was what the ingredients were in in their cosmetics and, and a lot of things that had been ingredients for in some cases more than 100 years began to be pulled out of um, out of cosmetics and out of things which which actually has caused them a lot of problems because parabens are very very good at keeping mold and fungus at bay and some of the sort of natural alternatives that they're using are not um, so it actually means that many modern cosmetics will go off much faster than the ones that used to but it's basically um it's basically based on fear. It's based on the idea that there are all of these terrible, terrible toxic chemicals that are gonna do terrible toxic things to your bodies and that you have to get rid of them. It's very like wellness in general, it's very pseudoscientific. There's no scientific authority behind this. There's just a general um, fear around anything that has a chemical name attached to it. And it's very striking that a number of the clean wine people come out of the beauty sector, like the Good Clean Wine, women who have a beauty spa in Missouri, like Catherine Powers, who's the, um, the partner of Cameron Diaz and Aveline. So they're bringing this, these ideas from clean beauty into wine. Another company is Scout & Cellar, which is a multi-level marketing company. It is 
huge business. It only started less than five years ago and it's already now got a turnover of, I think, somewhere in the milieu of about $70 million. Started by a woman called Sarah Shadonix, who tries very hard to hide the fact that she calls herself a, a sommelier. She doesn't appear to have any sommelier background. She's got a WCT level three. And she goes out of her way to hide the fact that she used to be a lawyer for a company which dealt in bulk wine. Um, she's, her, her origin story is that she started this company because she, she discovered that she was feeling sick all the time from drinking wine and she went to, she, she's very vague about this, whether it was doctors or naturopaths, and they told her it was the additives and chemicals in the wine that were hurting her, um, her health, so she started this company to have wines that don't have any of these nasty, dreadful toxins in them. It's gone off. It's it's absolutely huge success. It's interesting also that um, she does the lab testing. All the wines are about purity. Again, it's got this language of morality and and you know so they've got rid of original sin. Um, and and once again, if you go on the website, it's very hard to find out where the wines actually come from. Um, this isn't an authenticity movement. This is about this is about the health claims primarily, not about um, you know it's really it's actually really hard to find out who makes who makes the wines. But what they're using is a tactic called disparagement marketing. Again, this is all over social media. So if you look at the, um, if you look at the sort of the little picture there with all of the, the claims. So, um, you know, it's got, it's, it's not made in a laboratory, suggesting that other wines are made in a laboratory. It doesn't have 250 commonly added additives. Well, of course, there are 250 commonly added additives. Um, there's also sort of, um, you know, it's got zero GMO ingredients. Um, it's got no ferrocyanide. I actually had to look some of these things up. I discovered that ferrocyanide used to be used in Romania to remove excess iron from some vines, but it actually, it's actually been illegal for a really long time. It's been removed from, it's still on the list of additives that you can use in the United States, but it's being removed at the moment. Sometimes things just get left over, but you would, you would, you would look really hard for a really long time to find anyone who was using ferrocyanide. Um, the question, of course, is are they right? Are they, have they stumbled on something that the wine trade really needs to look at hard? You know, are we, uh, is, is, is the wine trade hiding a multitude of sins? Are conventional wines toxic in the sense that they mean toxic, which is that they have all sorts of dreadful things that are going to do you harm? Well, there is something in wine that in some people will cause problems. And this is this biogenic amines, which are a byproduct, particularly of malolactic fermentation. They're mostly found in warm climate grapes. Um, and of course, if you, so it, it can give you a slight, um, if you're susceptible to it, it can give you a slight um, histamine effect, a slight allergy effect. It's very interesting that one of the women that started the Good Clean Wine Company started it because she came back from Europe and discovered that, that she'd been drinking wine in Europe with no problem. She started drinking wine in the United States and suddenly she felt really lousy. I suspect what, and, and I suspect that she was probably drinking oaky Chardonnay or um, a Californian warm climate wine. Um, and the thing about amines that makes them really difficult is that they accumulate and they're also found in food so if you've got a sensitivity towards this and you're drinking an oaky chardonnay or a butter chardonnay or you're drinking a cabernet sauvignon and at the same time you are eating charcuterie or fish or cheese you're going to get quite a load of these um, biogenic amines and what you will blame is you'll blame the wine but they can accumulate in your body over the course of a day so if you have a meal in the morning and you've got bacon for breakfast and then you have lunch and you have fish and then you go out and you have a glass of wine and you're having charcuterie and cheese if you're susceptible by then you're going to feel pretty rotten but you'll blame it on the wine pesticides for a story i did for, for vine pear i actually went through all of these claims pesticides is an interesting one obviously pesticides are bad for the environment are but are you drinking lots of them if you drink wine? And the answer is no. The LCBO in Canada actually tests every single wine that, that passes through their doors. And in 2019 to the beginning of 2020, over that 12 months, they tested 22,600. And of those, there were only 20 that they found uh, pesticide residues in. So are you drinking lots of pesticides? No, you're not. Um, again, GMO yeasts, in theory, they're illegal in the EU. In theory, there could be wines that would have GMO yeasts being used. In practice, it's not possible. I spoke to um, Professor Van Vuren, who actually developed the two GMO yeasts that were licensed for use. And 
that he produced them in 2002 and they were all used up and now he's retired. Um, he says he gets constant requests to go back into production because um, one of the yeasts that he produced actually reduces biogenic amines and that's why he, that's why he developed it because he, he suffers from the same problem. But even if you wanted to use these yeasts, you can't. There are no GMO ingredients in wine. Um, so then you think, well, okay, so all of these clean wine companies, uh, they, their profits are soaring. So is this a market opportunity for everybody else? And unfortunately, the answer has been yes. It's already clear that while people aren't being as, um, as bold as the claims of the clean wine company, that these kinds of claims are already creeping into general wine marketing. And this is, I think, is where things get really dangerous. So this horrible little product was launched last month. This comes from Australia. It's, um, it's uh, Sauvignon, 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 Sauvignon Blanc from Western Australia that's been coloured with botanicals. We've already seen this same kind of stuff from Spain with the blue wines. What's different about this, though, is unlike the blue wines, which were being sold as fun and for young people and as almost like a, a gimmick, these people are serious. They, they've actually had a lot of media where they say um, it will give you less of a hangover. And they say it's been developed to minimise synthetic additives like sulphites. This is specifically being marketed as being better for you. Um, and I think it's a, it's a sign of how dire the media is that um, Perth now actually ran with this story. This is a, um, an email that I was sent the other day and I've kept the name of the winery in it because I think this should be called out and I think if they're dumb enough to send things like this out then they deserve to get bad publicity for it. Um, so the, the press uh, person from Avignon, I can never pronounce it, Avignon Nazi, sent out things saying that um, the winemakers avoid using harmful chemicals in the wines and these wines are healthier for consumers. Now I think we could agree that using keeping harmful chemicals off the vines is better for the environment but what, is, what do they mean healthier for consumers? So I said she wrote to them and I said what do you mean by that? And she, she, she came back and she said they don't use harmful chemicals and therefore the wines are a healthier choice for consumers. I'll she, she believes it. Now this is this is an absolutely outrageous claim for a winemaker to be making because first of all it's not true that I mean if you're using harmful chemicals to produce wines then you're doing something that's completely illegal and you should be prosecuted. Um, but but secondly this is just this is just um, this is just nonsense marketing the idea that there are wines which are healthier for you than others. All wine has alcohol in it and it's alcohol that is quite toxic and anything else is not is in no way it compares to the, the dangers of alcohol. There's another danger in this, which is that fear-based messages actually bring down the whole market. There was a 2016 study done in the US, which was really interesting about pro-organic messaging. And um, some researchers looked at the result of pro-organic messaging in um, a couple of lower income communities. And what they found was that people's overall consumption of fruit and vegetables dropped. It wasn't that people began eating organic, it was that they couldn't tell the difference. They'd heard the message loud and clear that there were some vegetables and fruits that were loaded with pesticides and which were bad for you. But since they all looked the same, they couldn't tell which ones it was. So they just avoided fruits and vegetables altogether, which of course is a catastrophic outcome. Now in wine, this is even worse because all of the wine bottles look exactly the same. So if, you, if, if one group of people in the wine industry decide to tell others that, that their wines are healthy and great for you, uh, implying that everybody else's are unhealthy and full of toxins, they're not going to get a market bounce out of it. What they're going to do is they're going to bring the entire wine market into disrepute. But I think there's something even much more dangerous about this. First of all, making health claims is against the law. It's against the law in the United States and it's against the law everywhere else. Um, the TTB was pretty much defunded under Trump. Um, it became a toothless tiger. It, it noted that um, the, the health claims were proliferating, but it wasn't able to actually go after anybody. But it probably will under Biden. And so um, Italian wine companies that claim that their wines are healthier may be in for a nasty shock sometime soon. But even this isn't the bad thing. This is tobacco. Tobacco for a long time made bogus health claims about cigarettes. And guess what happened? In 1994, they were hauled in front of Congress and fined. It was the beginning of the end of tobacco. Now we can all say, great, nobody misses cigarettes, goodbye. But it's important to note that what happened to big tobacco is they weren't banned or fined because their cigarettes were bad for you. 
They got into trouble because they lied. And if the wine industry goes down this road of lying about wines and saying that some wines are healthy and some wines are good for you and that other wines are full of toxins, this is where we might end up in the future. Um, and I, I think given the fact that the World Health Organization, that all of the big international health organizations are coming out and cracking down on alcohol, I think this is a real possibility. So that is my presentation. I hope I haven't spoken too fast, which is what I usually do. Um, but if you have any questions, let's have them. Felicity, thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, there was one note in the in the chat from Beverly. Beverly, would you like to to um, make a make raise your point and and uh, stimulate some discussion about your question? Hi, hi, Felicity. Um, I I quite agree. Thank you. A really interesting presentation. Um, I quite agree with you that that people shouldn't be making health claims about wine, but um, I do think that you're in danger of you know kind of putting aside one sweeping assumption with another because there are plenty of claims um i mean i thought that statistic that my my comment in the chat was that um i i what i took out of that um that stat about the lcbo was wow that's pretty surprising that there were any wines that exceeded the lcbo limits whatever they are so there were 20 or 30 wines that exceeded the pesticide limit so how many more wines are there that do that? And there've been other studies that show that that ninety percent of French wines do have pesticide residue. Yeah. This is a, for me. The question a, is really, what about that? Um, okay. and those this, are more damaging, yeah, considering pesticides. That's all. But this, this become this is a really really difficult issue. So this comes down to toxicity levels. I mean. There's a group in Europe called the Pesticide Action Network that every so often will, you know, get a whole bunch of wines and they'll test them and they'll, they'll find pesticide residue in them. The, the thing is always the Paracelsus, it's the dose that makes the poison. You know, apples have cyanide in them. All apples will have cyanide in them because of the seeds that, you know, because seeds carry cyanides. Um, so the, the testing that is done on pesticides and what is the human uh, limit for pesticides are actually really strict, particularly in Europe. I mean, one of the other things is um, all the wines have glyphosate in them. There's nothing that we eat or drink that doesn't have a level of glyphosate in it. Some of that is from drift, some of that is from all sorts of things. But the question is about what is the toxic dose and it's been looked at is it is it accumulation if you drink and eat lots of things will, will they accumulate in your body um and whatever and it is a it is a very very scientifically difficult issue but the issue of pesticide residues in wine is it's it's the there there will be some pesticides but the limit of them is well below the limits that will affect human health and the, the other the other thing is that the other thing is is that um it's this question of drift. Sometimes there are sometimes there are things like glyphosate, the glyphosate that turn up, and it's it's got nothing to do with winery. They may not be using glyphosate at all, but glyphosate turns up in everything that we eat and we drink now. Yeah. But can I just say, don't you think that the um, but if you look at it the other way, would it, is it not commendable to try to alert consumers? of that i mean who knows that the the limits they put on pesticides today i quite agree you know it's the, the dose is the poison but surely it's better uh to know about those things to know that those things are going on and i i've seen that guy todd um is it todd white yeah i've i've followed what he says and i, I think he's a he sounds like a complete nutcase he sounds like he has no credibility at all i was astonished that he has a hundred thousand followers because he, I, he doesn't seem to have a lot of credibility to me um but i do think that I mean, I, I do think that we, we can't be too careful about the pest, pesticides, et cetera. And just because there isn't a, a wine with no glyphosate in it doesn't mean that's okay. No, sure. But, but this comes down to the question about what, what is it that we're going to tell people? Are we going to say to them, um, stay away from wines that have any pesticide in them when it, you, there might not be any? I mean, do you know what I mean? And, and also the... Um, I, I think I think in the end all that we can go on is we can go on what what are the public health I mean what what do the authorities say about limits and if the public health authorities say this limit is within the tolerance for human health is it a good idea for everybody else to go guess what there are pesticides in wine even though they're parts per billion actually this is I actually spoke to pesticide action network and when they were talking about um 
you know, detectable residues, and you can detect them at parts per billion. Now, a parts per billion is, is meaningless from a human health point of view. Um, so, and it's interesting how often I've asked people what, what level of pesticide they've detected, and they won't tell me what parts per million or billion they've found because they don't want people to understand how low the risk is. That's, that's the other thing. There are groups that are like pesticide, I'm just kind of raving. There's groups like Pesticide Action Network that are trying to make a very important point, but they're also dishonest about what they're finding because they don't release how much they're finding or what they're finding. So there's a lot of sort of vague messaging about pesticides in wine without people actually coming out and saying what it is that they're finding. So I think, I think this is such a fraught and dangerous issue. Um, Becky Sue, you had a really interesting point in the chat about how the message is is presented. Would you like to raise your comment? Yeah, is my video open now? Yeah, um, okay. I think uh, I, was... Johan, I think we were going to ask Becky Sue was going to uh, raise her question, and then maybe you could you could come in with yours. Oh yeah, um, thank. Hi Meg. Hi Felicity. Um, I really think we need a positive message. I found that if you tried to deny things, that just sends a negative message. And it would be great if we, at the CWW, could create a positive message around this. Does anyone have any ideas what this would be? I think uh, you've just popped up in the cat. Ingredient labeling is definitely part of the solution. Um, that, that's coming, um, I'm, I'm told, in Europe later this year. I mean, I think, I think one of the things is that um, that's really interesting is when I was researching this, I discovered that the amount of additives and stuff that's being used in wine has actually been dropping in the last 20 years. There are fewer things on the registry to be used now than there were in 1997. Um, as, as viticulture gets better, people are getting more and more hands off. Um, so I think, I think in terms of the the way wines are affecting the environment, they're certainly a lot better than they were. Um, I don't know. I, I think people talking about their land is a really positive message, talking about the care for their land. But I think, I think once we get into talking about health in any dimension, even positive, it's dangerous. Yeah, I, I just to chime in, uh, you know, one thing that really struck me during your, your talk, Felicity, was how as wine writers and a lot of wine marketers, They've emphasized origin, like wine origin, the terroir, the the farming, the the making, in in the narrative. That's where we've put a lot of emphasis over the last decade. And what a lot of these marketers seem to be emphasizing is consumption. They're really focused on on the the end use of the wine as opposed to the origin of the wine. So it's a really different focus on the on which end of the arc. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the things that's really interesting about a lot of these products is it's clear that consumers don't care about the origin story, they don't care about the authenticity story. Um, so they're, they're buying wines that are, I, I think the rest of us would think are pretty technological. Oh, I, when I said I would try to get out of the pesticide action network, the parts per minute, it wasn't them, it was somebody else, so I don't want to defame them. Just correct that. Um, Jochen, do you want to uh, raise your question? Um, I think you're muted. Andrea, do you think you could unmute him? Just, just to be clear, I just want to go back. I'm not, uh, I just want to be clear that I'm not advocating for pesticides in wine. What I'm saying is that it's a lot more complicated than there are these toxins in wines that are going to poison us. Jochen doesn't seem to be able to get off mute. I'm not sure how you can get off mute, Jochen. Beverly, did you want to speak quickly? Sorry. No, I just wanted to make a point actually about, um, uh, sorry, Felicity, I wasn't trying to suggest that that's what you were thinking. That wasn't really what I was thinking you were thinking, sorry. Um, but I was just gonna type this in the chat anyway, but I was thinking that maybe, you know, talking about positive messaging, perhaps, you know, in the long run, all of this kind of talk about clean wine and the general disparagement of the uh, the regular people who've been making wine for forever, perhaps it's going to come full circle in that it will mean that consumers will ask more questions and yeah. they'll realize, well, hang on, everyone does this, and there's nothing unique in what these people are talking about. Um, so actually, you know, you could say it's a good thing because you you are going to hopefully end up with a more educated consumer uh, who's going to start asking the right questions, and you know, most people have perfectly valid answers. 
So yeah. and I think I think the natural wine community have been really really good about that. I mean I think they have. Um, you know, they have started the conversation. I think it's a good conversation to have. I, I should say that some of some of what's happening with this is some of it is being consumer driven. Like some of it, um, it's clear that consumers do want, uh, particularly in the United States, they do want less sugar, they do want less alcohol, all of that. But some of it, like the disparagement marketing, is being marketing driven by people who are looking for a, um, a market advantage. And I think they're the people that are, are, are quite possibly going to do a lot of damage What's really interesting when I speak to some of these people as well is how little they know about wine. They're, they're, they're just complete marketers that actually say this stuff, which is just pulled out of their ass, basically. <laughs> the, the, Cameron, the great Cameron Diaz uh, comment, that I don't know if you saw it in that video, was that she was saying, you know, they don't even wash the grapes. Right, that's right. <laughs> I mean... Well, I was just saying, before this started, she's actually just released... Another Aveline, it's a it's a bottle of Carva, which is twenty five dollars for three hundred and seventy five mils, as of this week. So there's a lot of money in this. One question I have, Felicity, is why doesn't the U.S. government stop them doing it if they're making false claims? I think, I think they I think they will. I think it's this. I think it comes down to the TTB, which um, is in charge of this. Um, you know, under under the Trump administration government was kind of defanged in lots of ways. The TGB did put out a newsletter last year where they said, we're noticing that there are more of these claims, watch out, but they didn't react. But I, I suspect that under the Biden administration, they might be empowered to start cracking down on it. And I just think if that happens, it's going to hurt the whole wine industry because consumers don't seem to know the difference between you know, one claim and another. City, do you get the sense that that the people who are, you know, the biohackers or wellness community, are they only drinking wine as their alcohol, or are they doing hard seltzer? And to what extent are the is clean wine competing with other intoxicants? Healer is what I got. Oh, this is this is the other thing. When I went on Instagram and I was looking at this, the clean wine and the fitness wine, it's very obviously people who want to drink lots of wine and feel fine about it so um it's actually it's actually amazing so i've got a peloton bike and i'm i'm part of various peloton communities and the number of people that will cycle while they've got a cocktail popped on the peloton or they will do yoga while they've got a glass of wine there or something and it's it's very obvious that they they want to find an excuse to consume alcohol and and offering lots of health messages around this is giving them the permission that they want to to, to drink in ways that are actually insanely unhealthy um, you know, if you look at the if you look at the clean wine community that's around Scout and Sellers on Instagram, it's obvious these people are drinking bucket loads of wine, but they feel like they have permission because it's it's you know healthy wine, and I think that's a really dangerous side of this too. Um, Neil, you had a comment about Oregon that there's a lot of um, it's not getting traction in Oregon. Would you like to sort of explain to us what's going on there and what isn't going on in Oregon? Sure, is I'm not sure. So, yeah, I, I unmuted myself here. Yeah, I mean, this is a state that prides itself on, uh, you know, being uh, sustainable and environmentally uh, conscious and so on. And and I'm pretty well plugged in this to what go, goes on around here. And I've seen no evidence whatsoever about any of this clean wine taking hold. There's, we, we have a lot of biodynamic wineries, uh, which is different. Um, you can argue that there's a whole part of it that's nonsense because it's attached to the astrology and so on, but uh, no aspect of it uh, is, is attached to bogus health claims. It might be bogus scientific claims, but, but um, I, you know, I think this is more of like a California phenomenon. And since they're 80% of our wine industry, they get more of the attention. Um, I, I would like to mention that having 100,000 followers out of a population of 330 million or whatever it is, is not exactly anything to be concerned about. You could probably put up anything on the web these days and get 100,000 followers. Uh, you know, we, we have, there, there's a vast 
fabric of opinions around here. And uh, with the internet, it's not hard to, to get that much attention. So I'm not sure if that's, that's any concern, but you'd figure that in a state like Oregon, which really does pride itself on stuff, this clean wine would, would pop up and yet uh, I've seen no evidence of it. I might also add that states have a lot of influence on uh, regulations regarding wine. In Oregon, we're much more strict about um, the percent of grapes uh, being used before the claim can make, be made on the label. And I think if things got out of hand, if, if the uh, government, if the federal government hadn't gotten involved, the state might, might get involved. Is there any feedback from the other big Californian producers? Because obviously if it's affecting their domestic or home market, surely they would be the people that would be um, making comment, re responding to this. I, I, I don't follow California so much. Um, we actually, some of us call it Baja, Oregon. Uh, we, we tend to sort of regard it as its own universe. Um, I mean, California is, is, a, is literally uh, a whole other country, in, even in terms of, of uh, having a north and a south and so on. Um, they would be more conscious uh, also like, like Oregon in terms of uh, protecting the environment and coming up with their own regulations, sometimes to a fault. I mean, you can't go anywhere in California without seeing signs about toxic this and toxic that and so on. Uh, but I, I haven't, uh, to the extent that I follow California, I haven't seen anything. So, so Felicity, do you think this is, and this has been a, a comment in the chat as well, do you think this is a uniquely American phenomenon? Um, because it is, it is. they're using French and Spanish wines often, these producers, right? I think, like I said, this, this specific category of clean wine yeah I do think it's 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 purely an American phenomenon but I think I think it's at the most flamboyant manifestation of something that is going on which is this this idea of um you know healthy versus unhealthy wine I know when I wrote a story about this in the Guardian I was contacted by somebody in Australia who immediately um uh, trademarked the name clean wine Doc, uh, the website .com.au and she said this would go off here and and the fact that there's an Australian an, an awful confected purple product which is beginning to make these claims um, you couldn't in any way shape or form call that a clean wine but but the, these claims are being are being picked up I think is really frightening. Michelle you had a comment about about Avenue um, that it was surprising to you that they were going down that route do you want to share your perspective from Italy? Yeah, uh, thanks, Meg. Um, fascinating, uh, Felicity, this, this whole talk and uh, conversation. Now, I haven't uh, been aware of anything of that kind uh, coming from, from Italy, as I said in my comment. Avignonese is not owned by an Italian, it's owned by a Belgian uh, company, uh, Virginie. As, um, she, she's, she's from Belgium, I think. Um, if I'm not mistaken, and um, I know her kind of PR um, person in the company is also not Italian. She is I'm not sure she's Scandinavian. Um, so I don't know whether <laughs> that indicates anything different, um, a kind of a different um, uh, uh, mentality or different way of seeing things. Um, but, but I haven't come across anything similar. Um, and I was you know, quite surprised to see that. Um, oh, well, that, maybe, that you know. to, be clear, to be clear, that was from their American office. I see, I see. Well, then I'm sure you know, it, it must have originated from, from the American office because I don't see them as sort of being, um, sort of flaunting this or you know, kind of um, um, advertising or promotion or, or philosophy in Italy. But um, so, but yeah, I haven't heard anything from, from any Italian enterprise. Mm. So why do you think it captures this, the American imagination so much, Felicity? Ruma just posted something. It's like, sales are obviously strong. 
Why, why do you think it's so effective? Uh, look, I think it has to do with, um, I actually think it has to do with critiques of the food industry over the last 20 years. So the most sort of one of the biggest books this century was Michael Pollan's book, um, called Meg 2006 the omnivore's dilemma and where you know they really ripped the lid off US agriculture and just how you know wretched animals are treated how terrible the monocultures are how awful the the fast food is how fake it is and I, I think I think it's very easy for, yes exactly and so I think a lot of times when people particularly in America are talking about wine they're talking about natural versus other wine they've got that that food model in their head that there's kind of natural authentic wines and then there's the fast food model and that that all of these white you know whereas actually it's it's a it's a metaphor that doesn't work very well the wine industry is actually quite different from um from the food production industry but so i think i think the questions that have been raised around food and particularly around fast food in the last 20 years um have have made people think that that you know maybe wine is the same and actually it's it's not it's got nothing in common with that sort of vast well, I suppose some parts of the American thing, but, but you know, wines are much more, um, it's, it's a much more diverse ecology. You've got little tiny producers, you've got big producers, you've got a whole range of ones in between. Whereas it was, within agriculture, you tend not to have that. You tend to have these really big farms or you tend to have these very small family farms, but there's not that sort of diversity of food production in the US. Um, whereas there is in wine. So it's not a very good, it's not a very good match. But anyway, so long story thought, I think, I think the discussions about food have finally caught up with wine. Um, and, and also it's part of this collapse of scientific authority as well. It's part of the rise of pseudoscience. Um, and, and that's really where wellness comes from. It's, it's a pseudoscientific view of, of health rather than a, a sort of scientific medical one. Yes. Beverly. Uh, yeah. yeah, hi. Sorry. Um, Felicity, I just wonder, are you seeing any connection between the sort of the, the clean wine movement and um, sustainability? Or is it just, you know, looking after number one? No, that's a, that's a really good point. And that's what's really striking about this is that when you look at, at, at what's being sold, it's it's completely inauthentic as, as, as we would see it, um, you know, and it's very, it's very much about looking after number one. So you look at the way that the biohacking and wellness people talk about food, and it's kind of awful. It's all about food as fuel and, and being broken down to its macronutrients and, and, you know, whether it can stop inflammation in your body. Whereas I think one of the great things about wine is the way that we think of food as being an act of sharing you know it's an act of sitting down and talking and it's an act of generosity um, but but yeah this whole movement sees it primarily as as um, what what's the impact on me is it going to optimize me can I can I go to the gym with this uh, it's it's and and that's why they embrace really highly technological products so it's, it's a paradoxical movement hmm. Liz, I think you made a really good point in the chat about um, tarnishing <laughs> really well-made wines and organic wines. Um, would you like to share that? Yes, I think the difficulty is going to be for us in the UK and Europe where this movement hasn't got going yet, is if we're um, supporting organic wines, which I think many of us like to, um, and people who are very much aware of environment and so on. Um, are we sort of setting up the scene for the clean wine movement to move in? I, I, I think it would probably manifest differently in Europe, but one thing that does, I mean, one thing that does concern me is I, I do see a general rise of pseudoscience anyway and I think that is beginning to affect the wine industry like some I'll give you an example like I think I think we would all agree that terroir is very important and definitely looking after the the land is you know it's life or death now with climate change but I'm hearing more and more people talking about wine as a quasi-religious experience that that you know that that, it, that terroir isn't simply about respecting the land anymore it's almost like letting mother earth speak through the glass to you and I um I, I can't put it better than that, but I feel like I feel like there is a creeping kind of pseudoscience entering wine as well. Yes, that's frightening. Um, but uh, it, it, there's this great difficulty in educating consumers for all the, the millions of words that we write. Um, they get through, unfortunately, to very few people, while something like this clean wine 
movement has got the potential of, of getting of, of attracting a lot of people who wouldn't dream of reading what uh, most of us uh, uh, write or, or spread in other ways. Um, so it, it's, it's frightening really that if we're trying to uh, promote the better side of wine growing, sustainability generally, um, and caring for the, the earth and caring for the people who, who work um, in wine. Um, the, the, the delicate balance before we encourage people to go too far. I, I, think, I think the only thing we can do is stick to facts. Um, the, more that, the more that we insist on facts, the, the stronger it is. I mean, one, one thing I would like to see, this is my personal bugbear, is I really hate the way that so many um, articles about wine and, and health using, using poor quality research, you know, like somebody can, somebody can float a, a temporary paper on something and suddenly it's all over, drinks business and daily mail about how red wine will help cure Alzheimer's or breast cancer or something. And I, I really wish that kind of reporting could go away. Yeah, I think there's also, Liz, to, to your point, the, you know, we are wine communicators. Some of us also sell wine, you know, as part of our portfolio of products. But I think the narrative is coming from these very well financed, yeah. you know, startup companies. And there's a lot of money to do social media buys and whatever, like, you know, little biodynamic producer, organic producer in Oregon or in, you know, Tuscany, they, they don't have the like voice. You know, so I think Felicity's right. As writers, we have to just, you know, not spread fake news, basically. Yeah, Marcus has just asked, what could come after clean wine following the pseudoscience logic spiritual wine? I think we're already seeing that. I think that article I showed from the New York Times about, you know, natural wine is my self-care. She actually says in that it's a it's a spiritual choice to, to buy better quality wines. And I, I don't know about you guys, but that just makes me cringe. Um, I think by... by you know, there is there is some wine that will make you feel lousy in the same way that lousy food will make you feel lousy, you know, if it's poor quality. Um, and I think, you know, buying better quality is a good thing because, you know, good quality products are always going to taste nicer and, and um, they are definitely better for the earth than poor quality products. Um, but that's a different argument from it being a spiritually better product, um, you know. Any other questions? Authentic wine, not the same as spiritual. Well, I, I even think, you know, we, we, we have to be really careful about what authentic wine is as well, because, you know, if you look at, um, if you look at what, what is being described as authentic wine quite often, it's, it's actually sometimes quite a narrow definition of wine. It's always the small family owned winery and they've often been on the land for a very long time and, and whatever, and, and you never hear about, you know, 50% of wine in Europe comes from cooperatives. Is that authentic wine or isn't it authentic wine? Um, you know, I, I, think, I think even about our view of what, where wine should come from is beginning to narrow as well. It comes down to, um, authenticity comes down to um, honesty, doesn't it, at the end of the day, as, um, as you were saying? Yeah. You know, something that's just, yeah, not hiding anything. <laughs> But maybe, as I think somebody said earlier, maybe ingredient labelling will uh, will be the way to go for wine. What do you think about that? Oh, I think it's a I think it's a great thing, and I think it's I think it's going to be complicated, but I think it's long overdue. And I think for most people, most people probably won't care. You know, I think in the UK, that the is it the co-op's been doing it for years and years and years. Um, you know. I, I think, you know, I think transparency is a great thing. The more transparent we are, the better. Um, and the more fact-based we are, the better too. Well, Sidney, what do you think about the warning label? You know, in the US, we have the sulfite labeling. There's the pregnancy, you know, warning. There's, you know, I think that the labels that are required by the EU and the US, they, they, they emphasize toxins and bad for you. Do you think that plays into this at all? Well, funnily enough, funnily enough, no, because it's not, I mean, the, the number one toxin, there is a toxin in wine, we all know what it is, it's yeah. called alcohol. alcohol, but that's the one that nobody ever talks about, it's all of this other stuff is a convenient way to sideline alcohol so that people can drink more, I really think that's what this is, it's a, it's a, it's a permission based marketing system to say you can drink as much as you like, by focusing on these other irrelevant things rather than the alcohol.
Any other thoughts, comments? No. Felicity, any final thoughts? No, I think I've I think I've talked it myself out. <laughs> well, I think this was fantastic. Um, Andrea, back to you. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Felicity. I think you've uh, opened up a topic and made people maybe hopefully think about it and maybe spread the word uh, really about, you know, being truthful and don't self, you know, don't send out a fake message really um, and try and, you know, continue to support a, such a big industry really and not let somebody come in that's, uh, you know, not making correct claims really. Um, and it's up to obviously members of the circle and to spread the word really. And uh, thank you very much for your time, Felicity. It's been wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity. It's great to talk to everybody.